Hi, everybody. This is Pastor Alex Lapos of the House, Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Today, we're going to study the book of Hebrews, chapter 3 and 4. So let's begin right away because we have a lot to cover. I'm going to ask Caroline to open up in prayer. Father, we thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for every single person that made time in their schedule to be here and to, to learn of you, O oh God, and what you want to share with us. Bless Pastor as he speaks. Bless him uh, also in his body, Lord. We continue to believe as a congregation and as the body for the full healing, the full extent, Lord, of what you paid for on the cross, Lord God. So we thank you, Father, for healing his body from the soul, from the top of his head to the soles of his feet, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. And let your word go out powerfully. Amen. Amen. So we are on Hebrews chapter 3. And chapter four. I don't know why I didn't put it in, in chapter four, but let me put it in now. There we go. Three and four. Okay. Now, the book of Hebrews is the only epistle in the New Testament that does not have a name attached to it. The Apostle Paul attached his name to all his epistles, and James to his, and Peter to his, and John to his, but Hebrews has no name. And so, the um, I guess the conclusion is it's an anonymous writer. Let me just let this person in, whoever it is. There we go. It's an anonymous writer, but it was likely a collaboration between the Apostle Paul and a man named Apollos, who we discover we meet in the book of Acts. And I think the reason that they didn't put their name to it was because it would have compelled the Jews to focus on the writer rather than the subject. The subject, of course, was the Lord Jesus Christ and how he gives us a better covenant than the covenant of Moses, the old covenant. And if they had put their name to it, I think uh, it would have caused some trouble because Paul was at odds with with Jewish believers all through his ministry, and Apollos was an unknown. So if it, Apollos had put his name to it, it would have been no credibility whatsoever. And if Paul had put his name to it, there might have been a conflict. So they decided to write the epistle and not put their names on it at all. So let's learn something about Apollos. I took this right off the internet. Apollos is first mentioned as a Christian preacher who had come to Ephesus probably in A.D. 52 or 53, where he is described in the book of Acts as being fervent in the spirit, who spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. Apollos was an expert in Jewish customs, an expert in the law of Moses, but he was also an expert in the Greek language. In fact, his Greek was impeccable. His Greek is more advanced than all the rest of the Greek in the New Testament, which is why some skeptical scholars believe that it was not written by Paul. But Paul must have collaborated with Apollos because only the Apostle Paul would have the knowledge that we see in the book of Hebrews, which connects the Old Covenant with the New Covenant in Jesus Christ. Only the Apostle Paul would have that kind of knowledge. And Apollos would have the Greek skill to be able to put it together in uh, in language form. So so, so I, we're sure, pretty sure it's an uh, a collaboration between the two. Now, the Hebrews, the book of Hebrews focuses on who Jesus is first and then establishes how he is the fulfillment of the Jewish faith, of the Hebrew faith. And one of the reasons why they wrote this epistle was to silence the Judaizers. The Judaizers were people who felt that you couldn't be saved unless you followed the law of Moses. And some Jews were confused as to what they should do. So this epistle was written to silence the Judaizers and to assure born-again Jews that they were not forsaking their ancestors and Moses, because that's what they thought. Now, here are some of the standard descriptions of Jesus that we know today that we're familiar with, and I'm going to read them to you. Jesus is a redeemer. He's our savior. He's our best friend. He's our true love. Jesus is faithful, perfect, alive, calling us, undeniable. Jesus is soon coming. He's amazing. He's beautiful. He's merciful. He's holding my hand. He's everything to me. Jesus is glorious, holy. He's the deliverer. He is the word of God made flesh. He's the Lord. He is the peace of God, Prince of Peace. He's forgiveness. He's the miraculous miracle worker. He is with me and in me. He's a healer. He's a strong tower. He's forever steadfast. He's the blessing. Jesus is real. Jesus is the reason. Jesus is the promise to fulfill. Jesus is the salvation of God. He's the shepherd of the sheep. 
and he is the risen savior out of the grave and he is god in the flesh so those are the standard definitions or descriptions of jesus but hebrews takes a very different approach and that's what we notice immediately in chapter 3 verses 1 and 2 watch this therefore holy brethren partakers of the heavenly calling consider the apostle and high priest of our confession jesus christ who was faithful to him who appointed him as moses also was faithful in all his house so these are two different descriptions that normally we don't hear about these days but they were specifically aimed towards jewish believers jesus is described as an apostle an apostle is somebody who sent out that's the greek word for apostle a sent out one and jesus was sent out by god the father to establish the way of salvation and announce the coming of the kingdom of god so jesus is portrayed as an apostle in the book of hebrews but he's also portrayed as jesus the high priest and the reason he's portrayed as jesus the high priest is because he was appointed by god as all high priests were to be the focus of the new covenant as moses was the focus of the old covenant so jesus is compared to moses immediately in the book of hebrews it was also to create an allegiance to jesus and away from moses because jesus is a better covenant jesus is a greater promise jesus is a greater fulfillment and we need to remember that this apostle was written to converted jews who were not sure if they were forsaking the lord by worshiping jesus so this business of the old covenant and the new covenant being brought together and fulfilled in jesus is still a stumbling block to jews today and it was a stumbling block even to jews who had just accepted jesus as their savior back in the old days so it had to be established immediately that jesus although very similar to moses was greater than moses and so there was no forsaking of the law no forsaking of jewish tradition to follow jesus in fact it was the fulfillment of jewish tradition to follow jesus so this is what chapter 3 establishes in the next few verses for this one jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than moses and as much as he who built the house has more honor than the house for every house is built by someone but he who built all things is god and moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be speak spoken afterward but christ as a son over his own house whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of our hope to the end so this particular passage that i just read to you this one demonstrates that jesus is greater than moses because he is the builder of the house and the builder of the house is the kingdom of god which is centered on the relationship between god and his people whereas moses was a custodian of the house big difference between a builder of the house and a custodian of the house moses was a servant jesus was the master and since moses was the custodian of the house it was because he brought the law to Israel, which at the time was the house of God. So here's an artist's depiction of Moses bringing the law to people. Of course, you see numbers here, but it was actually written out in full script. So Jesus is greater than Moses because he is the builder of the house and he owns the house. And Moses was just a custodian who brought the law to Israel, who at the time were the house of God. Verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of the trial of the wilderness. Now, today, if you will hear whose voice, that's the question I asked myself. Well, since Hebrews goes into an elaborate description of who Jesus is in these passages up here, then the voice that they should not harden their hearts against has to be Jesus himself. It can't refer to Moses, but to Jesus. It has to refer to Jesus. And that's very important because it equates the voice or the words of Jesus on the same level as the voice of god because in the old covenant we read that it was god against whom they hardened their hearts so now hebrews is saying not to harden your heart towards jesus which puts him on the same level as god this is a warning don't heart don't harden your hearts that only god makes verse 9 hardening your heart where your fathers tested me and tried me and saw my works 40 years Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said they always go astray in their hearts and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath that they shall not enter my rest. I found that very interesting because I interpreted it to mean that a person who rejects Jesus is on the same level 
as the Israelites who provoked God in the wilderness. It can't mean anything else. Because you see here, it says, do not harden your hearts. And it's got to be talking about Jesus, which we established here. But then it refers to the children of Israel not obeying God in the wilderness. So then the obvious interpretation is that a person who rejects Jesus Christ is on the same low level as the Israelites who provoked God in the wilderness. And the rest of God in Moses' day, entering God's rest, was entry into the promised land. Now, my first question is, what is the rest of God under Jesus? What is the rest of God under Jesus? Joseph. Are you there, Joseph? Okay, we'll move on. John Carlos, what, what is, okay, Joseph, what is the rest of God in the new covenant? Aside from, um, well, the way you look at it is that, like, as us builder of the house, he is also, um, Jesus is a uh, uh, God in person himself. I understand that. But what I'm saying is but, that the rest of God in the old covenant was going into the promised land. What is the rest of God in the new covenant? Um, fulfillment of um, fulfillment, fulfillment of what was uh, written in the in the Old Testament. That's what right. I think. Right, John Cardos. What was the rest of God in the old in the new covenant? The rest of God is the walk in the Holy Spirit. Okay, the walk in the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's a good answer, Caroline. What do you think the rest of God is in the new covenant? Um. Well, I was thinking what um, my dad was saying. It's um, the fulfillment of, because Jesus came to fulfill what and to restore what was lost that was given to Adam in the first place. Yeah. Um, but now we don't have to do anything by works to earn our salvation anymore. We can rest in our salvation because Jesus paid the price for it. Okay. So for me, that rest is is a rest that is a faith in Christ, him having done the finished work. Mm. Yes. And us resting in that work, um, but also still having to work our salvation. Okay. All right. Verse 12. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. I found verse 14 very interesting because it connects with what I preached on Sunday, that the great challenge of the Christian life is enduring to the end. Entering God's rest depends on faith because it says here that the Hebrews were not able to enter God's rest, which was the promised land, because of their heart and belief. belief. So, therefore, I conclude that entering God's rest depends on faith. And faith is connected with obedience to the word. Obedience to the word. Hardening of the heart must be resisting the word through unbelief and turning your back on God. So, verse 15 confirms that by saying, while it is said today, Today, if you hear his voice, which is his word, do not harden your heart, do not turn against the word, as in the rebellion. Now, this is the second time in this same chapter that hardening of the heart is mentioned. Only this time, it's described as rebellion. Rebellion against what? Well, rebellion against the word, rebellion against the Son of God, rebellion against God's the, God the Father, rebellion against God's plan to give us into his rest, and rebellion in the in the way that we through unbelief refuse to obey the word of god so now what goes what causes people to harden their hearts today in this day and age what causes people to harden their hearts today christina um i guess when the flesh the flesh is more than the spirit Okay, when you're when, when I'm trying to find the example of like, I don't know, I guess like when you're waiting a really long time, 
and if the the lies of the enemy can come in your mind for an unanswered prayer and you're like oh you, you can be in your flesh and believing those lies and partnering with the enemy and saying oh god doesn't love me you know anymore you know and then you can harden your heart towards god if you you come into agreement with that lie kind of thing okay so let's not forget that hardening the heart is the seeping in of unbelief into the christian's heart the seeping of unbelief into the christian's heart which causes the hardening of the heart shamar why do you think people harden their heart? What causes people to harden their hearts? Unbelief. Yeah, it's um, but what causes unbelief in the Christian life? I'm not talking about unbelievers now. Oh, why would uh, it, why, I why would say it? that whole, you're angry with God, or you're not pleased with the fact that your life isn't what you um, expected it to be. Expected it to be, or promised. To be okay so angry with anger with god is one thing the flesh rising up they're kind of connected i think what about you jeffrey why do people harden their hearts my example is that of metal that's been heated and you put it in cold water and you quench it and repeat the process becomes hard and the so bible says we, we we must not quench the holy spirit so if we do that continually the hearts become hard oh, okay all right and uh, Justin, how do you how can we prevent hardening our hearts? What are some of the things we can do so that our hearts do not harden against God? Uh, the five pillar. Oh, the five pillars. Okay, so explain it to me a little bit. How does that help me not harden my heart? Start with the Word uh, of God. How does the Word of God help me not to harden my heart? Yeah, you're in the spirit more than in the flesh. Okay, how does prayer help me not harden my heart? Same thing? Right. And how does fellowship help me not harden my heart? Uh, you can relate to different things in the spirit. Okay. John Cardos, how does fellowship help me not harden my heart? Uh, it's, it's, um, I know what uh, it's. It's because it, when you have fellowship, uh, love can exist be, uh, between in the fellowship. Okay. And, uh, uh, love operating in the, in in the fellowship uh, removes hardness of the heart. Well, that's a good one. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, very good. And worship. How does worship prevent us from hardening our hearts, Joseph? When. Uh... When we know, uh, okay, uh, I think it's, it has something to do with your former question. What I, um, what I'm trying to get at here is that um, not getting um, in the wrong kind of crowd because people are easily persuaded by what's surrounding them, okay. and and so like if if we are truly, or if we truly believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And we worship him and we pray to him alone and stop listening to whatever people's, uh, whatever garbage is throwing, uh, being thrown our way. Then we can reinforce that faith, whatever God has given us in, in, in order to um, to stop the, uh, the, the enemy from uh, persuading us um, and believing otherwise. Okay. And uh, Oliver, how does worship keep us from hardening our hearts? Worship. By focusing on Jesus okay. with all our hearts, all our souls, all our minds, all our strength, and loving him with all we have. I like what John said a few minutes ago when he said that love softens the heart. So mm -hmm. I guess we could apply that to service as well. Because mm -hmm. if you're with other Christians in fellowship, their love for you will soften your heart. But your love for those who are lost, those who are hurting, takes the focus off of yourself and your problems. And the love of Jesus that pours out of you can also soften your heart. And uh, one thing, love of the world. If you love the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Oh, okay. That's a good one. So the love of the world can also harden your heart. Very Three, good. John. Four. That is an excellent point. Good points coming up. All right. Let's move on to the next verse, which is verse 16. Who having heard rebelled, still talking about the children of Israel in the wilderness. Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? 
Now, with whom was he angry 40 years? We're talking about God's anger now. Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness, and to whom he did swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see, here it is again, that they could not enter into his rest because of what? Unbelief. 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 And this corresponds to the record of the children of Israel in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 to 13. Let me read it for you. And this is being written to Christians now, being written to us Gentiles. I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. This is our ancestors in the faith. All of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them. All of them walked through the sea on dry ground. In the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses. All of them ate the same spiritual food, manna. All of them drank the same spiritual water. For they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them, and that rock was Christ. Yet God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. These things happened as a warning to us, so that we would not crave evil things as they did. John just mentioned that loving the world hardens your heart. Or worship idols as some of them did. As the scriptures say, the people celebrated with feasting and drinking, and they indulged in pagan revelry. And we must not engage in sexual immorality as some of them did, causing 23,000 of them to die in one day. Nor should we put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and then died from snake bites. And don't grumble, as some of them did, and they were destroyed by the angel of death. These things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. If you think you're standing strong, be careful not to fall. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow you the temptation. Uh, he will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. Now, that's a lot to swallow. But Caroline, what do we learn from that passage in general? In general, what do Christians learn from that passage? 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 13. Well, that we really need to put our faith in God and believe any of the promises that he gives us. And um, it, it, can you put back the passage? Um, sure, sure. I think it was something I wanted to mention from it. Sure, I'd be happy to. Just a minute. Just let me get it. There we go. It's a long passage, so I can start up here. No, <clears throat> slowly. Yeah, so not not to allow, for example, the the hard circumstances in our lives in general that come against us, because because the enemy will try and do anything to stop us from entering into the promised land. But if we look at the examples of what the Israelites went through, and we know now that this could have been even a trip that that could have been a lot faster. Uh, it didn't have to take them forty years to where God was taking them. Um, that it was necessary to have the right heart. It was necessary to be a faith that um, that God wanted to bring them in. He had no doubt he wanted to bring them in, but they allowed their grumbling, their complaining, and their unbelief to keep them away from it. And so many did not even enter as a result. Okay. And what do you think was at the root of their grumbling and complaining? Uh, let's see, who can I ask? Jeffrey, why do you think the people of Israel grumbled and complained while they were in their wilderness? Um, there are many reasons. Um, yeah, one they got um, they they pined they they long for the food of Egypt. Ah, okay, and there's one. That was even that was even despite the fact that they had food from heaven. Okay. Yeah. So they longed for the things of Egypt rather than the things of God, and that caused them to harden their hearts, which led to unbelief, which led to the destruction of them. 23,000 in one day. So we're warned not to fall into the same trap and allow our hearts to be hardened by loving the things of the world. Okay, now we move into Hebrews chapter 4. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, this is now being written to Christians, lest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have fallen short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith. There's faith again. Not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he has said. So once again, faith and believing God 
is connected with entering into his rest. Now, God's rest, as far as I'm concerned anyway, is about safely bringing you into the kingdom of God in spite of the many hardships that you will face in the Christian life. So based on this passage, Hebrews 4, verses 1 to 3, how could someone fall short of God's rest? And this is what we need to establish. How can God? How can someone fall short of God's rest under the new covenant? Sure. How can someone fall? How could somebody fall out of God's rest in the new covenant? How can a Christian fall out of faith? That's what I want to know. By turning their back on what they know is to be true. Okay, that's a good answer. What about you, Christina? How can somebody not enter into God's rest under the new covenant? Hmm. That's a tough one. Yeah. Let me go back. I was thinking of rest and then you said fall out of faith. And then my brain was like, oh, we're talking about something yeah. else. Well, oh, we've established that entering into God's rest is having a life of faith and in trust right. obedience, right? Right. So how can someone fall short of God's rest? Well, Sir Mar said not having faith. Not having uh, faith. That's right. And anything that causes you to have doubt, anything that challenges your faith, uh, a tough season, Mm -hmm, a crisis mm -hmm. of faith all of those things yeah, yeah does god say about people who lose faith during a crisis in the next passage you can see it so i swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest although mm. the curse were finished before the foundation of the world for he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this in this way god rested on the seventh day from all his works and again in this place they shall not enter my rest i found that interesting because everything has been done for us already all we need to do is believe it. The works have been finished since the foundation of the world, which means that God has determined his plan for man before the foundation of the world. And the work was accomplished in eternity before Jesus fulfilled it on earth. Isn't that incredible? Revelation 13, 8 backs that up by saying, all who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the, oh, wait a minute. Yeah. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. I'm not sure why it says that. It should say all those who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have been written in the book of life. Of the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. So we see here that Jesus was slain before the foundation of the world. Now verse 6. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, that is, some people will enter it by faith. And those to whom it was first preached did not enter it because of disobedience. Again, he designates a certain day in David, saying, Today, after such a long time as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. This is the third time now that we hear, Do not harden your hearts. We can refer back to the children of Israel. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. But there, rem there remains a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself ceased from his works as God ceased from his. So the conclusion I draw from that is, is that Josh Joshua led the people of God into the promised land. But it was only a preview of Jesus bringing us in, into the ultimate right place, of bringing us into the ultimate place of rest, which is the kingdom of God. So Joshua led the people of Israel into the promised land but it was only a preview of Jesus bringing us into the ultimate place of rest in the kingdom of God. And we enter it only by believing in Jesus and trusting in his work and hanging on to that work to the very end. Verse 11 confirms this by saying, let us be diligent to enter that rest. Let anyone should fall according to the same example of disobedience. So my next question is, can a Christian fail to enter into eternity? And if so, how? Oliver. Can a Christian fail to enter into eternity? By losing his faith? Yes. And um, think, thinking that the works that were done for him to get to heaven were done by Jesus Christ and only having faith in that, but rather trying to earn it by his own works. Uh-huh. 
So you say one one way to lose it is by trying to earn it yourself. Yeah. And another way is to turn your back on Jesus. 100%. So we conclude that a or Christian... Simultaneously, because if you, if you turn your back on Jesus, yes. then you believe that what he did on the cross is not enough for you That's to right. get to heaven. So you think you have to complete it by right. doing your own works. Thanks a lot. John, you have anything to add to that? Uh, yes, uh, only that uh, the rest is not equivalent to, to going, going to heaven. The millennium that's coming, I think, is going to be the the rest of we we enter a rest too, but but it, it will be complete when, <clears throat> when the millennium happens on the earth. Well, we enter into a rest because we're saved. We cease from our works trying to be saved. We grow. Yeah. Into, we die in faith, and we enter into the millennium, which is God's rest, and that leads into the kingdom of God. Right. Which right. is kind of like Joshua leading the people into the promised land. Right. Okay, so that's that's the conclusion that we want to reach. Okay, let's move on. Now it talks about the word of God, which I find interesting. It goes from entering into the rest, belief, faith, right to the word of God. Verse 12, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the hearts, of the thoughts and intents of the heart, and there is no creature hidden from his sight, that all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Now, why is the word mentioned here? Well, because the word creates faith. And the word exposes the difference between the soul, which is the emotions and the will, and the spirit. Let me put that in. Whoops. There. The word also heals, and the word reveals the condition of the heart. So the word is extremely important, and it is an extremely important element in entering God's rest, because it changes you, it transforms you, and it prepares you to, for entering that rest in salvation, and then eventually dying in faith, and then eventually being part of the millennium, and then eventually being included in the kingdom of God. So how does the word of God change you? Valerie. How does the word of God change you? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, I was in church with working. How does the word of God change you? He penetrates inside your heart. He yes. heals you. And uh, it's a new truth revealed. Yes. Okay, so it reveals truth and it penetrates into your heart. I guess we can say that the word of God softens the heart. And creates, yeah. and creates faith. Now, do we have Faustina here or do we have one of the daughters? Who's going? Is that you, Faustina, or is that someone else? It's Faustina. Ah, Faustina, good to have you. Faustina, you. how does the word of God change you? The word of God advises us in many, many ways. Yeah. How to live a life, how to live a Christian life, how to depart from sin. It's it's it, it it's it basically is uh, the word of God is like a school. It teaches us everything if you follow it. Everything in life, the word of God uh, teaches us. Okay, so the word of God teaches us. It softens our heart. It sanctifies us. It makes us more like Jesus. It guides us. It helps us, and it moves us into the kingdom of God and enter and enables us to have faith to enter into God's rest, which is what Hebrews chapter four is all about, based on who Jesus is which is established in Hebrews chapter 3. He's the builder of the house. He's the new Moses. He's the fulfillment of the covenant. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And no one enters into God's rest apart from him. So it's all connected, all connected, all connected. All right, let's move on. Now the word leads you to Jesus through the gospel, which leads you into the spirit-filled life and then gives you access to the throne of God through Jesus who is the high priest and apostle of our confession. So the way Hebrews started in chapter 3, Hebrews ends in chapter 4 by reminding us that Jesus is the great apostle 
and high priest of our confession, and that through him we have access to the throne of God. The reason we have access to the throne of God is because we are now spirit-filled people. The reason we are spirit-filled people is because we believe the gospel, and we believe the gospel because we believed who Jesus is and what he's done through his sacrifice on the cross and his resurrection. Which brings us to the very last point. And all the work is done supernaturally by the Holy Spirit. Seeing then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. We should never lose hope because we have somebody who is on our side no matter what we're going through. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin, which means that he can give you the power to overcome any sin. So now, how do we access this incredible source of wisdom, power, and transformation? One final verse, the final verse 16 gives us the answer. How do we access this source of transformation, wisdom, and power? Here it is. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Now, how do we enter into the throne room, Caroline? Through the worship and praise. The worship and praise, yes. Anything else? Well, prayer as well. When we enter, um, when we when we pray, we enter the Holy of Holies. Yeah, that's right. We enter the Holy of Holies. And this is a great artist depiction of what happens when we pray. Now, I'm telling you, if we could actually see all this, <laughs> our prayers would be a lot stronger and our prayers would be a lot more effective if we, could, if we could see where we stand, where we are when we get down on our knees or when we bow our heads or when we begin to pray. In fact, every Friday at Danny T's house, this is where we are, right here. I know we can't see it, but in reality, this is exactly where we are, before the throne of God, surrounded by the angels of heaven, and based on his word, we come into his presence and we ask the petitions that are on our hearts. And that's what it's all about, entering into God's rest and using the wonderful privilege of prayer to be enter into the throne room and see God face to face and experience the rest of God in our lives every day of the week. So that's all for this week. Christina, would you close in prayer, please? Pastor? Yeah. There's something on my heart. I, I just feel like I, I wanted to add to this also, if you don't mind, if you're okay. Go ahead. Because I keep thinking about the Israelites and how they, they kept hardening their hearts and 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 um, God, uh, for those who had stayed in the wilderness, for those who were hardened and, and didn't continue to believe, they were the same ones who witnessed God dividing the sea and opening up the way for them. The same ones who saw him get the Israelites stuck in that sea and 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 vanquished them against the the armies of the greatest one of the greatest armies on earth and and then they saw him provide they saw him do the 10 different you know the, the 10 plagues they saw them come in and out and and how god took care of them and it just it's just coming back over me again and again like a wave like that we really need to go back to the place where we look back not the way that lot's wife looked back but we look back at all the times that God has been faithful in our lives, that we allow that along with everything else that we see in the word that we ought to do and believing. But we remember his goodness and his faithfulness because he's, he's intervened so many times in our lives. He's, he's done miracles for us. He's provided, he's brought us the right people along our way. He opened doors like the way that he opened the sea, you know, so many times we get hardened and we fail to remember what God has done. And it's just strong in my heart tonight. I don't know why. Maybe it's because we're approaching Thanksgiving. But I just really sense that uh, God's putting his finger on this. That let us remember to keep looking at everything he has done to spur us to continue to believe that what is now in front of us, he will do that too. Okay, well, that's an excellent summary of Hebrews 3 and 4. Thank you very much, Caroline. All right, Christina, close in prayer, please. Father, we thank you for what Jesus accomplished on the cross for us, Lord. Thank you that the veil was torn, that we can come to you boldly. 
that we obtain mercy, that we find grace and in, in help in time of need, Father God. We thank you that our names are written in the book of life, and we thank you for your rest that we get to, to bask in, Lord. And so, Father, I just pray a blessing over each one here tonight. God, continue to be with us throughout the week and fulfill your purpose in our lives for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And we're so grateful tonight to have Chris, uh, Faustina with us. So, Faustina, God bless you. Thanks for coming. We really Good enjoyed man. having you. Hope to see you, you again. Good night, everyone. God bless you. Yeah, I love you guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.